made a car in Jojibra, but it's not a static car. It moves. Look at that. Uh, this is just a tiny bit of fun and kind of making the point that animation and aesthetic design needs a chunk of maths almost all the time. If you ask any video game designer or graphic designer or animator, I'm pretty sure they'll say, hey, we need some maths. Sometimes you just need maths to understand the programs you're working in. But actually, you need some basic maths just to be able to make something look nice. And that's what I tried to do here. I've tried to make a car that rolls. It has rolling wheels. Uh, and I've also tried to make it move in a way that's not linear, just to make it like eased. And I've tried to make it, this is a little bonus, bump up and down because the wheels weren't exactly round. Uh, to do all those things I took a, a few minutes in Jojibra. And I'm going to show you how I did it. And I also want to talk about how to make things convincingly look like they're rolling anyway, which is kind of the point of me starting this little attempt. Let's get to it. Rewind a bit of time. Right, I want to make a piece of animation. I want to make a piece of art. I want to make a car that rolls. And to do that, I'm going to first have to sort out how to make a rolling circle, get the principle of how to make something look like it's rolling, because Jojo is not a physics simulator, and I can't capture friction and just make an object roll, but I can make it look like it's rolling. So let's do that first before we get into importing some pictures and making this look like a sort of fun, cartoony car. Right, I'm going to start with a circle. So I'm using Jojo Classic 5 here. This, All of this will work in uh, almost any version of Jojo you're using. I find it easier to work with Classic 5 uh, because I can things like I can separate the windows. I can pop out the algebra view, for example, and move that separately, uh, which you can't do in the other versions. But these are minor things, and I've just got used to this version. So let's make a circle that's going to look like it rolls along the x-axis. Um, I'm going to make a slider first called R, which is going to be the radius of the circle. Let's make it go from 0 to 5. That's fine. I always always make the increment small so I've got a smooth thing, but this is just meant to be the radius and how do I gonna how am I gonna do this? I'm gonna put a point which will be the center of the circle. Uh, and if I put that a distance up on the y axis of R, then the circle of radius R will always touch the x axis. What do I mean? I mean let's go zero R like that. And make a circle. So that's a point A radius R. Now this doesn't move around because I've made A fixed there, uh, but I can change the radius and it just stays on top. So that, that means I've built something which I can now vary later on. So if I want to make the, red, the circle that rolls bigger, I've got a slide to do it. I'm sort of future proofing it. I'm also going to turn off labeling for everything other than new points. That's just going to save me some label hassle. It's quite useful to have the points on because you might want to label them or use reference them later. You can always turn them off individually. Okay, so the basic thing here is I need to make the circle appear like it's rolling along. So to do this sort of animation of time, I'm going to make a slider called T, which is T for time. And I'm going to let that go from 0 to 1. And the idea being that I want this entire motion to sort of start at 0, finish at 1. I do need to be able to control how far this goes. But this is going to be like the engine that drives everything. So nothing's moving at the moment. That slider just changes the number. The obvious thing to do first is just to move the circle according to that slider. So here's an easy way to do that. The translate command. Translate C, which is the name of the circle, you can see it there, by a vector. And if that vector depends on T, I'm just going to... It recognizes most times a point as a vector as well. So the vector T0, if I drag T around, look at that, I've got a circle. It's only moving from 0 to 1. So what I could also do is have another slider for the sort of length of the runway I want to use here. Let's call that D for distance. And the figure rotating circles depends on pi. Let's make it go up to like 6 pi. I'm going to want a multiple of 2 pi. In fact, I can make it go in increments of pi over 4 or something. And then dragging it around, I'm always going to get some sort of nice multiple or some fraction of pi. Okay, but now instead of translating this circle by t, I could do t times d, and then although t is only running from 0 to 1, the translation will run from 0 to whatever d is. And now if I drag t around, you can see, oh look, I've got a rolling circle. <laughs> I magically, not magically, I, I fluked the end there. I didn't really think about that, but that is about 6 pi there, so it's fitting nicely on the screen. If it didn't, I could just zoom out, fine. So there we go, rolling circle, done. Well, it's obviously not rolling. Now, the illusion that it could be rolling, Let's just turn off the original things here. Like 
I can believe that's rolling. But I've got no reference point, so if I want to make the illusion stronger, I should, you know, put some spokes on the wheel or at least put a dot which is rolling around. And that's the hard bit, right? If I just put a dot on this circle just by clicking on it, it's not going to roll with the circle because all I'm doing is translating it. So what I have to do to create the illusion is rotate the circle or whatever bits of the circle I want to look like they're rolling at the correct rate so it looks like it's rolling. And that is the, a piece of maths here. I want something that rolls, so I can't just turn at anything. It's got to roll at precisely the rate that it's covering the distance. So for example, when, when it's gone to there, I need the circumference Oh, I need whatever's been in there to have turned three full turns because it's gone six pi and one turn of a circle is two pi. Um, let's think about this. That would be true if the, the radius was one, which it's not. And I've deliberately made the radius somewhat random because we need to think about how how far this will roll after a turn. It's not two pi, it's two pi r. One revolution of this circle rolling should map out the circumference in a straight line, which is two pi r. In fact, the angle you turn multiplied by the radius is the arc length, and that's the bit we want to roll into a straight line here. So let's let's start by putting a point uh, at the top of the circle, and I'm just going to call this uh, 0, 0,2r, and let's put a point up there. It's called it B. I don't want to move that point around. What I'm going to do is make a sort of copy of B that does move with it. So the first thing first, I'd like it to translate with the circle. Uh, let's translate b by the same vector we had before which is td0 and that should now move along with the circle not rolling um, and then I want to get the center in fact let's also translate no 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 translate the center of the circle which was an a is that right yeah by the same thing td comma zero and that means the center is going to move and it's called it a dashed and b dashed and what i want b dashed to do is to rotate about a dashed so as long as a dashed is moving with it it's going to be rotating around the right thing so let's just upgrade the definition of b dashed i want it to be translated then rotated so i'll just put the rotate in front so rotate that thing by an angle which i haven't figured out yet about a so what angle does it need to be well it's the angle that corresponds to an arc length, which is the distance it's moved. And the distance it's moved is TD. That's the whole translation we've been doing all the time. Uh, but theta r, angle times radius, gives me the distance. And I want to know the angle here, so I'm going to have to do, if theta r equals the distance, I need to divide the distance by r to get the angle. So it'll be this distance I've just typed in, divided by r. And I think that's it. That's not it. What's going on here? So. It is moving B, but it looks like it's rotating around the wrong thing. Why is that? Okay. Why, why is it? Looks like it's, it's coming back over there. Why is it rotating around? Let's check the definition. What did I rotate around? Oh, I'm rotating around A, which is the point there fixed on the axis, so it's A dashed to rotate it around. Now, ah, look, it's rolling, except that it's definitely wheel spinning. What's happening is that the rotation by default, Jojo has to pick a direction for rotation and by default goes anti-clockwise. Long story why, good reasons why, it's got to pick one of them, it goes anti-clockwise. If I want it to go clockwise, I better make the angle negative. Please work. Yay, we have a rolling circle. Okay, uh, that is the hard work done. I'm going to hide B, I'm maybe going to hide A dashed, I'm going to hide the label for B dashed, and I'm just going to animate this. Lovely. And the catch here, let's check everything moves with it. So if I reduce the distance, it's going to roll. This one's only going to go up to 2 pi now. So we should only get one revolution. I'm going to speed up the T a little bit. You know what this is going to be? Let's just make it go to 4. So that's half revolution. <clears throat> ah, so this 2 pi business would be fine if the circle was a unit circle. Let's just check that. Yeah, we get a full revolution there. But the first other thing, well, not the first thing, the other thing we're now, now just checked is it does look like it still works with a different radius. So it has to rotate at a different speed, but because I was built on there, but this distance, um, let's just let it go further. I don't really care how far it goes. I've just got a control for it. It's definitely rolling. And that's because we've made the illusion of moving this circle, sliding it around and at the same time, rotating a point around at the precise rate it would roll at. 
That's the only clever thing I think going on here. Um, the reason I wanted to start with this though is I made a, a making a bunch of JoJo shorts at the moment, basic advice about the commands, and I did the locus command, which is an extremely useful command. I'll show you again here. And the demo I did was what's the locus? What's the path of this point as it rolls? Classic piece of non-obvious maths, a curve that maybe you don't expect, and you can always trace a point by right-clicking on the thing and just letting it animate, and then it will trace it out. But it will leave you a gappy thing depending on your increments. And if you move the screen around, it vanishes. And so what we really want is the locus of that point. And I did the short on how to do that using the locus command. Um, basic locus command, hover over it, select locus point, and then point on object or slider. So it's the point B dashed as T moves. And there is the path. And this is the famous curve called a cycloid. It's the path of a moving point rolling on a rolling circle. All sorts of nice things about it, including curves of le least descent time. This is a uh, quick and efficient way for a thing to roll down. Perhaps it would be better to talk about it in another video, not this one. The main goal here is that I've built a rolling circle and recognize, please, it's an illusion. The circle is just being translated, but the point is being translated and rotated about the center of the moving circle, and it looks like it's rolling. Now, all that remains, really, is to make a graphical update to make this look like a car that rolls with wheels that spin which I think I'll do probably not by putting dots and drawing spokes in Jojibra. I can just get some graphics, grab some images and put them in. But I'm going to have to do the same maths to account for the rotation of the wheels. And we might be able to have some other fun as well. So let's move on to the graphical version. OK, I've got a new window up. I'm going to start from scratch with this. Um, what I have done is found some images I'm going to use. I found an image of a car that was Creative Commons licensed, so I can freely use it. I'll put the uh, license details in the comments but other in the yeah in the chat below the uh, video and I also chopped the wheels out because I want them to be separate so I can spin the wheels separately from the car now to get pictures into Jojibra it's actually pretty easy there's an edit command you can uh, from this menu grab an image from a file and go and browse for the file you've downloaded or if you've copied something you paste it in sometimes these don't work or the clipboard is like in the wrong format uh, either way you can just drag an image in so I've got a gif file uh, that I, I think I chopped the wheels out in uh, GIMP, the new image manipulation program, very useful free open source image manipulation program. And you see I just dragged it in and there it is. A um, few things to mention. It appears as a pic. Uh, if I hover over you can see it's called image pic one. That's not turning up in the algebra view. That's because for some reason it calls the images uh, auxiliary objects. Maybe because you don't often need to refer to the images, you just want them in there. But I do want to refer to the images. So if you right click on the algebra view, you can turn on the auxiliary objects. In fact, you can change the properties of any object. Uh, and in the properties, you can see that it's ticked as an auxiliary object. If you don't want it to be that sort of hidden, you can untick it. And now it will appear even if I turn off auxiliary objects, it's there. Secondly, if you don't tell it anything else, it, it comes up with two points, which are the bottom left and bottom right corners of the image, uh, which control where the image is and how big it is. You can separately get the properties of the image and allocate its position by giving it other points. If you've got points already on the screen or those points move around, you could say, don't use A, use whatever point you want. That would be a nice way to move or manipulate images. Um, it's also got another corner, and this way you can sort of change the resizing. And there's a center image, Ooh, and you just choose where it goes at the center. That, that That's new. I hadn't seen that before. It looks like it's now just focused on point A. But you don't get a huge control about the size of the image there. So I'm just going to leave it like that. And now I've got a resizable image again. OK, uh, don't want a new point, undo that. Drag it around, fine. I can hide those points later. I'll, I'll just make it horizontal for now, uh, which I can usefully do by snapping these to the grid points. And let's get some other images, which are going to be images of the wheels. Uh, I think I just grabbed one of the wheels, and let's drag that in. There it is. It's a car wheel. It's giving me two points again. Obviously, it's way too big, but I'll just resize that. and. I want two wheels from the side view of this car. Let's get another one. Oh, and I need to make them the same size. The thing is, actually, maybe I don't want two wheels. I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to delete this one. And what I'll do is I'll get one of the wheels working and then get the other wheel working by just shifting a copy of that, rotating and everything, into the other wheel hub. At least that's my plan. OK, how are we going to do this then? We'll need a few things like we had before. So a slider just for time. Uh, let's just call that T from 0 to 1 again. Uh, and make that go up nice and small increments. And let's have a slider for D, which is the maximum distance we want this to go. I don't really care about the pie business, so let's just... Currently my screen's going up to about 25, so let's go to 24. We can always change this later, 
but we'll use that as a control for the distance this is going to move and basically I want the car to run from say like if I, if I put the back wheel on zero to run up to there so actually this is going to be slightly too big but if that gets to 24 yeah, whatever we can always zoom out I want to avoid zooming just one axis because you'll see the images do scale with that I can stretch the car and I don't want it to look like that if you ever do that by the way you can always right click on the background X axis Y axis and just pick the right ratio which is one to one down there and we'll zoom out with your mouse wheel or whatever device you're using okay let's just say the car looks like that I'm intending to be able to resize this anyway um, okay let, let's just translate the body of the car should be easy I would like it to move with my timer um, so let's just do that I'm gonna translate and this is where I need to pay attention to what things have been labeled translate pick one I uh, notice my wheel hasn't got a label because it's an auxiliary object let's just do the the car first translate pick one by a vector and just like we did before I want it to be t times d in the x direction and zero in the y direction hey we could make this start going uphill let's get the flat thing first and already that's given me another copy of the car which does move that is fine and it moves in this case up to 12 and I can make it move further so yeah that, that fits on the screen at the moment there we go there's my movement later on I'd like this to move in a more realistic way so this is kind of be, going to be very jerky which goes bing 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 we'll have to do some easing I think of this to make animation look nice another good reason to use some maths but for now what we realize is the original picture is just the reference so I actually kind of want to hide it and it's gone and I don't care about A and B I can turn them back on if I want to move things around but now all I've got is the moving car and that's great I didn't need to reference its corners I just grabbed the picture and translated it right what next I want to get the wheel to move with it but the wheel also has to roll so let's get the wheel right size first so I'm completely doing this by eye that kind of fits in there I might just zoom in a bit I can always zoom out to sort this out later on can I go okay I've got a few things when I try and click on the wheel the car is being selected so here's another thing you can do you can change the property of an object in advanced and this is the car now I can turn off selection allowed so now I can't actually click on the car and it won't get in the way and the wheel is the only thing I'm picking up I think that's what I want so will that fit in both hubs if it spins it looks like it might oh, it's not a perfect circle this cartoony version so maybe I should make it slightly smaller so that it will fit in both hubs I mean that looks like it will go and I want it to move just like the other one so let's grab oh, turn on the auxiliary objects we'll just leave them on and maybe I should rename these okay I should have done this first let's call the first one car that's the one that's hidden at the moment pick one dash is the moving car let's call it M car pick two is the wheel let's say back wheel And actually, as long as T is at zero, then it's the same as the original picture. So the, that wheel is the sort of reference one. I want to make another copy that moves. So let's say moving back wheel. Let's just get the translation sorted first. So translate back wheel by TD comma zero. Hopefully this moves with the car. Hooray, fine. I mean, it doesn't look great yet. And all I've done is just slide it along but we're making progress now I need to be able to rotate the wheel and to do that I need to know where the center of the wheel is so I'm just going to do that by eye again as long as I'm kind of embracing the cartoony nature here. as long as it's approximate we might get a slightly wobbly wheel but that's kind of maybe charming as well real cars have wobbly wheels mine does at least sometimes uh, so I'm just on the original wheel I'm just going to put a dot which is this, roughly the center of the wheel and I could zoom in and do this and actually maybe it's nice to make it look right in the center maybe this is going to be an important point so let's name it um, back wheel center let's just embrace long names that's fine okay and I want that to be translated with the other wheel so let's just translate that as well TD zero it's getting predictable and familiar now so that should now should move it um, we can hide the original one 
And now I need to rotate it. But the amount of rotation, and this is where we're going to get slightly fiddly, will depend on the radius of the wheel, which is not well defined because that's not a circle. And it's also not a circle size that I've got control over. It's just the way I've resized it to fit. So we need to have some measure of the radius of the wheel. And I think it's OK to do an approximation that's close to a circle. Otherwise, it wouldn't look like a good cartoon drawing of a car. So let's just measure that. Let's just put a segment. In fact, from there to any edge. And you can see it's made some new points, which I don't really care about. But it's also giving me a segment. And the value of that segment is its length. 0 0.6 is the approximation to the radius of this wheel. And I can hide it, but use that number to get the rotation. Whoops. I keep This is a very common problem with JoJo. You try and drag the screen because it normally drags like this. But if you're not on the move tool, you want something else, you start doing stuff. You can always just undo uh, or right uh, drag and delete everything. And if you're ever on the wrong tool and you try and drag, you think, oh, undo, and then press escape, and you'll jump back to the move tool. So I actually am pressing escape quite often when I'm working in JoJo. What was I doing? I'm trying to rotate this wheel. So the definition of the moving back wheel is at the moment just a translation. So I also need to add the rotation in. I've got a center to rotate it around. That's fine. So rotate. It needs the object to rotate, which is the image, after it's been translated, by an angle about center, which is called B wheel center dash. And there's my punishment for using a long name, but I think that's fine. The angle. Is the distance is rolled divided by the radius? This is the discussion we had before. So it's going to be TD. The radius this time is not some R slider. It's that thing I just measured, the segment F. So I'm going to divide by F. And I need to roll clockwise. So let's put a negative in there. It rolled. Suddenly, is it going to roll with it? Yes. And it kind of lumps, bumps up and down. That's OK. Already. I feel like we've made some pretty good progress. Now, the one irritation here, maybe it's not quite rolling on the axis. That doesn't matter. I can always hide the axes later on. It would have been nice to maybe build it on the axis, but I can't be bothered. If I turn everything off, I've actually got a nice, you know, maybe I can hide the originals as well. Those two I don't need. I don't need the back wheel there. So now I've just got a rolling back wheel of the car. I like it. OK, I'm going to put the axes back on for now just as a reference point. Uh, I need to get the front wheel. Uh, for simplicity, let's just copy that back wheel and put it in the right place. And this is, again, an arbitrary thing based on the original car size I've made. Um, so I'm going to put the original car on and maybe the original wheel. I just put a dot where I want the other wheel to go. And again, I don't think this, this is an artistic decision now, rather than needs to be mathematical accurate. I think that looks roughly in the center. Let's call that watch front wheel center. And now be, those two are fixed, but they don't move around. Um, so that vector between the two is always what I want the back wheel to be shifted forward by to be the front wheel. Um, Let's just make a vector. So there's a vector command in here. You can click on that, or you just type vector. Vector from back wheel center to front wheel center. Oh, it's off animating. Why did it? Why did it animate? No idea. All right, let's make the vector. It's called it U. It's put it on the screen. I'm going to hide it. Stop animating. There's a little pause button down here. That's fine. Uh, and I'm going to hide all those things again. The original car and those two centers. So I think getting the front wheel is now going to be dead easy. It's just a copy of this moving back wheel shifted by that vector. So let's translate. What's it called? Moving back wheel by the vector u. There it is. It looks ever so slightly lower than I wanted it to. So let's. That's because the front wheel. So maybe I just. I'm just going to hit. Looks like that hub is smaller. Hey, well, nothing here. What I could do is have it. I can, there are layers in JoJo, just like in a painting package. And actually, I think one of the nice things I could do is actually just make, I could have, have it hidden under there and make this look super sporty. It's never, it's never going to look that sporty, is it? Um, so let's do some layer playing while we're at it. Oh, I can't select the picture, but the, you know, it's called M car. 
let's bring that to a higher layer let's go layer three um, the higher number layer is further to the front I think and let's just make well the, the wheels are already going to be a different there we go it's hidden behind oh, that's cool I don't know if I like that or not but um, let's move the original like I can put that up a bit as well. oh what's going on here okay so because I'm changing one at a time Why is the other wheel not moving? Oh, okay, because I arbitrarily put that wheel there, and so that center doesn't control it. I have to physically move the wheel. Okay. Hmm. Let's just try and get it parallel. Okay, let's go with that. Hide all these controls. Waste a lot of time on that. I don't want the original car or the wheel. I just want this moving thing and we now have two rolling wheels <laughs> okay fine uh, I think this could have been done a lot quicker but I was just faffing around with the details so let's animate that and I have a car driving along a road now what's weird is the wheels are obviously bumpy and the car is riding really smoothly I think the rolling is looking about the right speed but that's approximating the radius so some of the time when the wheels are a bit shorter or wider it's not quite rolling at the right speed like a, a wobbly wheel moves you at different speeds from a constant rotation anyway which is why you don't really want wobbly wheels okay but good enough so there's a couple of other things to do one is um i want to make this this function just not go eh, eh, eh. i want to make the make it accelerate and decelerate and that's such a common thing in any motion that you're doing in animation uh, called an easing function making things start smoothly and end smoothly is basically just choosing a right function which is not a linear function to control things and this is just a slider moving in a linear way at the moment um, what I could do is talk about some easing functions and a classic thing in animation is called a smooth step uh, but we can talk for a bit of time about easing functions so let's do that now okay uh, easing functions big deal in animation or making things just look pretty even in making a PowerPoint slide look professional as opposed to a bit rubbish when if you make something move to make it move it just looks a bit rubbish but if you can go ooh, or zip and have some speed up and slow down acceleration deceleration to make it look slightly more natural it has a surprisingly strong effect on the aesthetics of the audience at least in my opinion and the opinion i think of almost every uh, animator or graphic designer if you're worried about motion making it look smooth and not horrifyingly jerky uh, is important so there is a classic uh, function called a smooth step uh, and this is built into many programming languages because it's used just all the time and actually if you want to see someone talk about the smooth step function and how they use it in their creative zone watch any video by Inigo Akile uh, who is a graphic designer and mathematician um, used to work for Pixar I think absolutely brilliant artist and mathematician and makes excellent videos uh, in the style of Bob Ross but painting with mathematics I can't recommend him enough uh, I'm not at that level but the smooth step function it basically looks like this. So I'm going to type in a function. It's 3x squared minus 2x cubed. Why is that a good function? Well, let's go and have a look at it. If I zoom in on this one by one square, 0 to 1 and 0 to 1, you can see that ignoring everything else, it starts from 0 and it ends at 1. And if you don't believe me, you could differentiate that and find the turning points. Nice little exercise. In fact, that's a good way of coming up with this curve in the first place once you realize what properties you want. And crucially, it's different from a straight line that goes, if I just do y equals x, that also starts at 0 and goes to 1. But that's how my car was moving earlier. It's just going and stopping. If you moved a car according to the function I just typed in, what it would do, it would start from a flat line, so slow speed, slow low gradient, move up to a quite a fast speed, higher gradient, and then slow down again as it got to the top. It's much much more natural we'll see this in motion but I've kind of arrived with this function by magic uh, should we derive it? I think we should derive it let's go and derive it I've just got a blank one note page here to scribble some maths on I want to show you a couple of ways of coming up with this function that lets you have a smooth start and finish uh, one of which felt more intuitive to me when I was like oh, yeah, wait, I don't accept this magical arrival I want to derive it and one which I saw uh, another animator claim to be the standard way uh, you choose which one you like First of all, a cubic curve is nice and curvy and smooth, and I can see that it kind of bends both ways, unlike a quadratic. So maybe a cubic is a good candidate for a, a curve that both has a, a, a smooth start and a smooth finish. So 
yeah, so let's start by saying, I want to build a cubic curve that has the properties I want, and the properties I want, let's get a pen working here, are that it starts at zero and finishes at one, one. And crucially, I want it to have a zero derivative, a flat gradient at the start and finish. And then I just want to let cubic behavior take care of the rest. So at zero, zero, I need dy by dx, or let's, let's say f dash. I'm going to create a function f f dashed of x needs to be zero at those points. So if I just come up with a cubic function that's the most generic I could come up with, let's call it f of x equals something cubed, and I can just pick some coefficients. That I think is a generic cubic function. Uh, I want to know what those coefficients are. This is a nice thing about polynomials, you know what all the algebra does, you just need the coefficients to determine exactly how it behaves. Then First of all, I need it also to be uh, f of x needs to be 0 at x equals 0, and f of x needs to be 1. Why am I writing this backwards? Equals 1 when x is 1. Uh, so does that help me? If I put 0 in here, f of 0 is d. So d is 0 from that one. If I put f of 1 in here, then I'm going to get a plus b plus c and that needs to equal one so there's a fact i can use later i'm not sure if that's the most efficient way to do this but that's definitely got to be true let's also look at the derivative f dashed uh and we get three a x squared plus two b x plus c and i need that to be both zero at zero and one so f dashed of zero is just c and c needs to be zero. Ah, oh, so that's going to make life easier. C is zero, and f dashed one, which is just three a plus two b. That needs to be zero too. So I've got another fact here, and I know that zero is replacing c there. So actually, I've got two equations uh, with two unknowns, a and b, simultaneously solve them. Let's do that. Uh, a equals one minus b from the top one. So I'm going to do three lots of one minus b plus 2b equals 0. Let's solve that. We're going to get 3 minus 3b plus 2b equals 0. And altogether that means b equals 3. And a equals, uh, to go in this one, negative 2. So my final thing is c and d are 0. My final thing, f of x equals uh, minus 2x cubed plus 3x squared, which if I write this in a slightly more pleasing way, is exactly what we wrote down earlier in GeoGebra, 3x squared minus 2x cubed. So there's one way of deriving this, what they call the smooth step function, which has the properties you want. If you want a cubic to have those properties, it's going to be that cubic. Uh, and it's so ubiquitous that most um, um, what they called animators will know this function. And if they don't, it's programmed into the, the software they're using, possibly under the name smooth step. Here's another way of deriving it that I saw someone claim was a standard way, but I don't know about you, uh, it felt even more magical. But what they pointed out is that the first curvy line you come across after a linear polynomial is a quadratic, and x squared looks like this. And actually, it has some of the properties we want in that it goes through 1, 1. This is just x squared, by the way, I was going to say. It's the most basic quadratic we can come up with. It's just a it has the property at the beginning as well, uh, which is, is flat here, but it doesn't have that property at the end. But if you look at negative x squared, which looks like this, um, you can see part of that curve is promising. The bit over here is kind of doing the opposite. It's starting steep and ending flat. So we need to shift that into the right position. We could uh, shift it by one to the right. If this was negative x squared, then shifting it one to the right would look like this. And that would have the function negative x minus one squared. GCSE graph transformation is there. Uh, it's not in the right place though. Let's shift it up by one so it sort of does this. That will be negative x minus one squared plus one. You see that that bit has, is flat at the top uh, and ends at one, but it hasn't got the beginning right. And what the person I saw explaining this claimed is, well, the combination of these two is perfect. And so let's just linearly interpolate between them, uh, which is a technical way of saying, like, let's start with one and fade into the other one. Uh, 
That's what linear interpolation is. And it's another really massive trick in any animation is to make one situation, another situation, and then just interpolate between the two, make a smooth function that goes between the two. Um, this time, just a linear function. Uh, so what does that actually mean? Uh, let's let's try and build it over here. At the beginning, down here, when x is uh, 0, I want the just basic x squared function to be working. So I'm going to put a 1 minus x multiplier in front of the x squared. So that when x is 0, that's just 1, that bracket. So when x is 0, the function is just x squared. Because uh, I'm going to put another term over here, which has got an x multiplier at the front sort of paralleling this one and I'll put the other function in here negative x minus 1 squared plus 1 what a mess and when x is 0 that is just 0 and so it's just, just not there conversely uh, when x is 1 this bit disappears and that bit is just 1 so we're at that function and that sort of basic assumption that you've sorted out the endpoints and everything else can just take care of itself is called linear interpolation uh, let's tidy this algebra up I'm just I'm gonna do the algebra I might even speed this up And there we have it. Uh, kind of messy algebra, but I kind of like that. Just oh, here's a curve that works for the beginning. Here's a curve that works for the end. Let's just blend them together. Gives me the same result. I found the using a bit of calculus to get the turning points in the right place much more intuitive personally. However, here is a function that blends from a zero gradient up to a zero gradient between zero and one. There are lots of other functions that could do this. Uh, in particular, a sine graph of some sort would do it. Um, there's a famous one called uh, the the arc tan I think is it is it arc tanch yeah the inverse hyperbolic tan function also has a nice smooth step look about it there's not one right answer here here's where sort of mathematics is meeting aesthetics all we're doing is looking for a function that has the properties that make something looks nice when it moves you can use anything you like you could piecewise define it I just want it to be there 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 and give it hundreds of points but here is a simple polynomial function which works. The only catch is it doesn't do anything nice outside of the region between zero and one. It goes all over the place. So we have to do what they call in the trade is clamping it. I want it to be zero uh, before you hit the zero and one afterwards. So it looks like just this step function with a bit of smoothing. And that's why they call it smooth step. Let's go and put it into GeoGebra. Okay, back in my little demo window where I put that function in that we just derived by hand. Uh, and let's clamp it like we we're saying. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the original definition of this function. You could do this from the word go without typing it in first. I want to say if x is between 0 and 1, in fact, equal to 0 and 1. So that if statement has got that first command in there, which is if 0 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to 1, then do this. Otherwise, don't do anything. And now I've got a function which only takes inputs from 0 to 1. Um, what I could do is if I wanted this to work on any input, as I could actually, actually add some other if statements in here, if I'm going to close it straight away, then x is less than 0, give me a 0. And then another if, close the brackets again straight away, x greater than 1, give me a 1. Now I've got the what they call the clamp function. It's zero there and it's one there. Nice and smooth in between. And you can see it's got this nice sort of conditional setup over here. That's, I think, what they technically call the smooth step function. In practice, I just want to make sure it's, it's that bit in between. And I could do this clamping or not. As long as I only put variables into it between zero and one, it's going to be fine. Uh, so let's put this back into our car file and see if we can make it look nice. And that was the whole point of going on this lovely diversion. So back to the car. Let's put a function in here. I'm going to call it S, uh, st for smooth step. Uh, ss. Oops. How do I acronize that? Smooth smuster. The function smuster is uh, 3x squared minus 2x cubed. I'm just going to use that version of it. Um, I don't want it to be visible. I just want to be able to pass a number into it. In fact, maybe we should put the if statement in there as well. Uh, let's just check that. Yes, this tiny little function down here. I don't want it visible. And now the catch is how do I make t, which is just a slider, change with that? Well, here's a neat trick. I'm going to create another slider, which is going to drive this. I'll just call it k. I want it to go between 0 and 1. But this is the one I'm going to dump into the smooth step function. 
and I want it to get the output of the smooth step function and make t that value. And that's prime candidate for a bit of scripting here. So in the number k, I can just say every time this changes, this number k, I'm going to set value of t to be the smoother, the smooth step of k. So it's going to grab the smooth step of k and make t that value. And now I've got two sliders, and what you'll see is that I can still drag t around. It does exactly what it did before. K is not changing. But if I do k, it changes t with me. And so if I actually let k animate, I hope we'll get a nicer animation. A little bit of acceleration up to full speed, which is not quick, but then it's going to slow down and stop kneeling. Now this would be much more obvious if I make this go quicker. Let's crank it right up. Nice. Compare that, if you like, with what happens if you just animate T. I'll turn this animation off. Obviously this is going slow. Let's get, did I put the other one at four? So this is just a linear, a linear one. Bonk. It just crashes into the end, bonk. Now maybe you want that for effect, maybe you want to crash. But actually, if I stop that animating and do it with K this time, we get just a really subtle difference. And this easing function is a big deal in making graphics look pleasing or realistic or fun. Okay, time for a challenge. Should we make this car uh, reflect its bumpy wheels? I think we should try and do that. Okay, to do some bumpy wheels business, uh, let's just reset to the beginning. It's really about about K, does it? The catch is, as this rolls, those wheels are not at the same distance from the ground, wherever the ground is. And I kind of want the ground to be flat and for the car to bump up and down. Since I've got irregular wheels, this would look much more realistic if it did bump up and down. And I feel like this is a bit of a challenge. I'm just trying to think my way through it. If I turn on some of the mechanism we had, so the front wheel center, the back wheel center, and the original one there, let's put the original wheel on. The, the way I could track the bumpiness would be to put a, a marker at the bottom of the wheel as it turns. Now the wheel is just a graphic, but what I could do is make a shape which approximates the shape of the wheel and rotate that and kind of measure its vertical distance. So I think what I'm going to do is first is make a polygon which approximates the shape of this wheel and that's going to be my proxy for the picture which I can't really use in GeoGebra. <clears throat> so let's do let's just draw a polygon. I'm going to use the polygon tool. I'm going to zoom right in here. I'm going to turn off the center. I'm just going to draw around it with a bunch of bunch of points. And I figure that the more points you use here, the more better approximated this is going to be. It's not quite going to be a circle, but it wasn't a circle to start with. That's right. With the polygon, you click on the first point you used and it finishes it. Um, what a mess. It's labeled everything. I thought I turned labeling off. Maybe not in this one. Never mind. Ugh. Poly one is what I care about here. Let's just turn all the other segments and points I've just made off. Turn them off completely, but I still want to see the polygon. It's quite hard to see. Oh, let's turn the things back on. So annoying. Turn the labels off. Let's hide the wheel. Oh, it's the original wheel there. There we go. So that shape is my approximation to the wheel. What I'm going to do is do exactly the same transformation as I'm doing on this graphic. There it is. Copy that on that polygon. And then I'll get that polygon rotating with the wheel. I think let's try that. So instead of translating B wheel, I'm going to do it on poly one. And everything else should be the same. It's going to use the same center. Okay, so that's over there now. Let's just check that's visible. Moving back wheel turn off. Oh, let's rename that one. That's now the front wheel, isn't it? Moving front wheel. So it's moving back wheels there. There is a polygon there. Does it roll? Okay, look at that. So now I have a, a sort of mathematical object. And what I'd like to do is measure the height of it from the bottom thing. Now, I think the easiest way to do that is to drop a vertical line through the center of the wheel that I'm using and just see where it intersects. And the intersect command in GeoGebra is going to do that for us. So let's make a, I'm going to use the command line perpendicular. I could use parallel perpendicular line through the point back wheel center dash. That's the one that moves uh, perpendicular to the X axis. That's the um, command for the x-axis or the name of the x-axis in GeoGebra, similar for y and z. 
and I could have done that in one command but anyway I've just made a new thing called a it looks like I want to intersect that line a with poly one dash I think that's probably what it called no oh, it's called, called it poly two ah inconsistent naming scheme right so it's given me two points w and z which as this moves around they do move up and down and w staying on the bottom so without thinking too hard about it the the distance from the center to w is a measurement of the current wheel height in fact what i could without doing anything else if i did the locus of w as t moves around <laughs> there we have a description of what road this car needs to have a smooth ride uh, and actually now that now that could look realistic it's driving on this perfectly bumpy road for it to have a complete smooth ride now obviously completely unrealistic but I find that quite pleasing what I'd like to do though is take that potential and sort of turn it into the car going up and down and not the road so I don't need that locus although it was nice bye bye bye, -bye nice locus let me just think about this I think that, that all I need to do is move the three images, which are the car and the two wheels, up by an amount that depends on that little distance. In fact, so let's turn off the things we don't care about. I don't care about the line anymore. Actually, I actually don't care about Z. I don't even care about W. What I care about is the distance between them. So let's just measure that with a segment between B wheel center and W. And that is going to move with me. And it changes, and that number B is going to be the sort of the bump at that moment. It's not the technical word for it. And I think I'm going to put the car up by a chunk all the time. But if I just put it up by an amount that varies according to B, then I think what we'll see is the car and wheel go up and down, and that means W will stay at a consistent height, which means the contact point will be on a flat road then. Maybe. And that means all my all my careful moving back wheels and stuff are going to become again sort of secondary. So well, let's just let's try this before I get too excited. Now I can just change the original instructions. Okay, so right, go, car moving car. Instead of just translating TD zero, I want it to have a vertical component. That's right there. It's that zero all along. I need to actually not just be zero. I want it to be moved up by. Uh, let's just go with B. That's the name of that little bump. Hey, I named it B. Judge renamed it B nicely. Thanks, Judge. Is that going to work? Let's just try it on the car. All right, so it's lifted it up too high, but does it? Nice. Okay, the car is bumping up and down subtly. I kind of want the wheels to do the same. Let's just do that. I'm going to leave that polygon in the background hidden because that's how I'm getting the calculation. Let's just turn them off for now. I don't care about the the B or the W. But the moving back wheel, I do care about. That's the bit that's rolling. I want it to be shifted up. But I think I could, that's easy enough because it's got that zero in there as well. Uh, do I want to do this after it's been rotated though? Yeah, I'm going to put a, a separate translate command around all of that just to avoid the order being a pain. So translate the one that's right there already by zero in the X way and then just B in the vertical direction. Close the bracket. Right, let's put it back where it was. And it's moved the front wheel because that depended on that one. I think it's done it. I think it's doing it. And all I need to do now is figure out what the road level is. I can just draw a line there. The road level will, will, will be what? Well, I think initially I didn't have a particularly consistent. So I'm just, it's going to be at the point where back wheel center is so I could just put a line y equals b wheel center no the y coordinate of back wheel center boom let's turn all these points off getting a bit messy but I think now I've got a flat road it's labeled a g1 let's turn the label off don't care about that oh I love that it just suddenly makes this look a little bit more alive, like a sort of slightly clunky car bumping up and down on the road. 
playing around with vectors and translations. Okay, let's just check the eased version. I don't know on the animation on T as well. Okay. okay, let's do some tidying up. Uh, turn the axes off. I could make that line a bit thicker. Let's do that. Yeah. In fact, I could colour in the bit below it. Let's use an inequality. Why not? Um, y less than the y coordinate of back wheel center. Just colour in the whole thing. Yeah, there we go. Why not? I'm not sure about the colour, but let's uh, let's change that in a second. Uh, we can make it grey for a road. Oh, don't want it labelled. dragging this around when it's moving which is hard to tell what's going on that's nice okay all I'm gonna do is tidy up uh, I'm gonna make this presentable um, and this is why I end up using GeoGebra Classic 5 because I can do this bit no other reasons to it so the algebra window I'm gonna pop out separately in fact I'm also gonna pop out I'm gonna open a graphics 2 window which is over here to start with and I want the sliders to be on that uh, let's select the sliders with the right mouse button drag and get their properties in advance you can choose what window they appear on so graphics 2 I want them over there and I'm going to pop out the graphics 2 window whoops I just moved it at the top but let's pop it out again and the sliders are slightly confusingly but... so this this can be a window where I keep the sliders like a little control window which I can sort of use off screen. If I'm presenting this, I'd have this on my own desktop and put the extended desktop, which I'm presenting, to have some nice graphics on. Uh, I'll turn the axes off on that. I'll leave it on the screen so you can see it still. Uh, and the algebra view, where's that gone? There it is. This is quite often how I'm working in GeoGebra, is having these two windows separate and having a nice tidy graphics window, which I'll bring back to the front and say, there's a clean version of a car rolling backwards and forwards with an eased bit of motion, rolling wheels, and a bump because those wheels aren't circular. Uh, this was an excuse to play around with some neat functions in GeoGebra and to do some nice maths to do with uh, rolling circles and cycloids. And also I got a bit distracted by the easing function. Uh, but I had some fun. I hope you enjoyed it too. I'll leave this playing uh, as I disappear. Uh, but if you've enjoyed it, then I'm glad. And I'll see you next time, I hope. <laughs>